Mercury was in the wrong place. Ever since Sir Isaac Newton had formulated uh, the laws of gravity that govern the motion of celestial bodies, uh, astronomers could predict uh, where planets should be. They would calculate their orbit, they would point their telescopes at the sky, and they would find the planets of the solar system exactly in the right place. And that was a triumph uh, of the theory. Every single planet, uh, except for one, the planet Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, it was almost in the right place, but not quite. It was uh, 100 kilometers further ahead uh, every year. And that was very puzzling. So at the same time, another scientist worked on gravity quite independently, and I think you know who he is. He was called Einstein. And at that time, it was already known that nothing can move faster than the speed of light. But the description for forces that we had at the time were not compatible with that idea. And, and gravity is a force. So Einstein wanted to solve this problem by making a new description for that force. And it's a purely mathematical problem. So he worked on this mathematically derived equations, took him uh, several years. And to find just a way to describe gravity so that nothing can move faster than light. And he achieved that. And he wrote a new theory. That theory is now called general relativity. So after writing this mathematical construct, it became quickly clear that this might be a very good theory because, for example, it could solve the problem of Mercury. It predicted correctly where that planet would be. However, it also predicted a few new things that we didn't expect. So what Einstein did is he used a new concept to describe that force. So he, he created this construct space-time which is the combination of space and time. And then he described gravity as a curvature in that space-time. Now, when you looked at his equations, they also predicted something weird going on with that space-time, especially when things got fast or heavy. So for example, there could be punctures, holes in space-time. That's what we now call black holes. And there was something else. If you move masses quickly around in space-time, there could be ripples propagating away from that at the speed of light. And those ripples is what we now call gravitational waves. So it was 1915, the theory of general relativity, with its wonderful predictions. You would think everyone would jump on this new theory and start to work out uh, the wonders of the theory. But nothing, absolutely nothing happened. For 40 years, uh, no one worked on general relativity. The theory was uh, really not relevant uh, for the problems uh, physicists were interested in those days. You know, the very small behavior of uh, atoms, subatomic particles, protons, electrons, neutrons. And uh, the theory was also extremely complicated. So Einstein, for example, talking about gravitational waves, said, uh, well, they are way too weak. Nobody will ever be able to observe these ripples in space and time. The theory was complicated. Einstein himself got very confused. And later in life, he said, actually, Gravitational waves are a pure product uh, of mathematics. They are not actually real. Yeah, so I actually got confused about his own theory. Um, but the good thing, the fascinating thing about good ideas is that they start spreading even without you. So at the same time, other scientists started to look at that and like what they saw. So they worked on the same theory, developed new ideas. And about in the 60s, people had, had for the first time the idea, hmm, we should maybe do a measurement. We should measure whether there are gravitational waves or not. However, at that time, technology was not yet ready. Why isn't that? So typically, we observe the world around us with our senses. So we, we see, we look, we listen. And when we build instruments, we build instruments that can do that better. So we see further, we can listen better. But gravitational waves are something completely different. We don't have a sense for them. 
they're a distortion in, in space and time. So what they do is they change length distances by a tiny amount. So we don't have an organ for that. So for us, it was a challenge to develop a completely new sense for these waves, building a completely new machine for these. So people had this idea, keep working on it, but it took some time. However, in the 90s, something changed. And what changed is a lot of people came together to form large collaborations to build large instruments together to measure these gravitation waves. And that was also the time when I started to work in science when I started my PhD. That was the 90s, and I saw when I started these foundations for these large instruments being built. And that was what drew me in. What I found fascinating is the idea that you build a machine that can measure something where nobody knows what they will see. And that's how I got involved in gravitational waves. So as Andreas started to get involved uh, in uh, building these new fantastic machines to observe gravitational waves, uh, and therefore to prove Einstein right or wrong, uh, I also started my PhD. And during those years, uh, it became clear that if you can detect gravitational waves, uh, you can read out uh, from gravitational waves uh, the message uh, that they are carrying uh, about the source that produced them. For example, black holes. So you could really use gravitational waves uh, to open a completely new window on the universe, to discover things you didn't know before and things you could not observe with the obse uh, existing uh, telescopes. And then I got really hooked. Yes, yeah, so that is what we built. We built um, instruments, two. They are called LIGO. They're located in the United States. They're large, large machines. So they have these four kilometer long tunnels in which there are laser beams that are used to measure these tiny changes in distance that a gravitation wave would create. And it's, it's a challenge because the distance change is so, so tiny. It's a thousand times smaller than the size of a proton. Okay. So it took us about 20 years to build those machines, and they're now taking data. So finally, on September 12, 2015, the LIGO instruments were up and running, taking data, monitoring continuously the sky, and we were searching for this elusive gravitational waves. And uh, the following Monday, September 14th, uh, uh, just a few minutes uh, after I got uh, to my office, uh, I started to look at the data with my colleagues. Uh, we saw a blip. It lasted only one-fifth of a second, and it had the signature, very clear distinctive, of a gravitational wave generated by a pair of black holes colliding. When I saw it clearly, I didn't believe it. I thought something was wrong. Everybody thought something was wrong with the instrument. So we spent the following days and weeks and months trying to figure out what was wrong. We slept very little. However, at the end of that, uh, we were left with only one plausible explanation. Those little wiggles were indeed gravitational waves generated by a pair of black holes colliding. So a billion years ago, in a distant corner of the universe, uh, two black holes about uh, 100 kilometers in size, one uh, containing about 35 times the mass of the sun, the other one about 30 times the mass of the sun, were in their final orbit around each other, and they collided at the speed of light, half of the speed of light. In that instant, uh, they released uh, the largest amount of energy that mankind has ever been able to witness. And that energy carried by gravitational waves 
these little ripples in space and time traveled over a billion years and on that Monday morning reached the Earth, wiggled the mirrors of LIGO by less than a thousandth of the size of a proton, and we had detected gravitational waves. Einstein was right. Huh? Einstein was right, but what is more important uh, is that in that very moment, uh, we also discovered something we didn't know about before. We discovered the first binary black hole. And therefore, in that very instant, we transformed astronomy. We opened, really, a new era for astronomy. Yeah, so what have we done? Together, us two, but in you know, a group of 1,000 people, we just achieved what we set out to do. We measured gravitational waves. They exist. Okay. But we also measured um, black holes. So why is that important? I mean, you've heard about black holes. They are in movies now. They, you read about them in books. But they are all fiction. So this detection in September 2015 was the first time ever that somebody measured a signal directly from a black hole. So we made black holes real. That was only the first touch of our new sense, and we will see many more things. But this making it real is what got me into science and what I find so exciting. We build things, and then we can separate fact from fiction. That's what we've done. So I got into science because I was curious. Physics was fascinating, and really, what I wanted was uh, hoping to get a job where every day I would find out something uh, more, ever so little. You know, I'm not Einstein. You do not need to be Einstein. I worked very hard. Clearly, I got lucky. But with Andreas, uh, with the people here in Birmingham, with our colleagues uh, around the world, we are now really pushing uh, knowledge at the most fundamental level. We are changing our view of the universe. We are you know, unveiling mysteries of the universe. And we have no idea of what we are going to discover next. Thank you. Thank you.